So welcome to the third session. And uh, I think you've been waiting for this uh, all day because we're going to be talking about an important topic that kept arising at every session, and that is statistic from whom to whom. Uh, we've been talking also about the 2008 crisis. Uh, we can't forget about that crisis. It hit us so hard, and we still don't understand how we didn't see it happen. So uh, there's certainly uh, one... Uh, uh, externality of that crisis is that we all realized that we had data gap, but we had bigger data gap than we thought uh, before 2008. And there's certainly uh, two aspects that uh, this uh, very uh, good panel will address. Uh, one is that we have to uh, identify how risk is built up in the financial system. And this has been something that we missed in the last crisis. And the other one is uh, we have to understand as well how the interconnectedness occurs between sectors, between countries, and uh, there has been a number of intervention today talking about the spillover effect and uh, the need to uh, ensure that we understand how the transmission mechanism occur. Uh, one of the uh, uh, respond of the uh, international community was the G20 data gap initiative. And as it was mentioned uh, in a previous panel, uh, this call for the development of a home to home matrices, both for flows and stock. And uh, at the IMF and other organizations have been working on balance sheet uh, approach. And uh, this is something that uh, our colleagues here will, will be discussing. Uh, so there's going to be uh, two, uh, two papers presented by uh, uh, our speaker, and I will introduce them uh, immediately. I'll, in fact, I'll introduce the whole panel. Uh, the, at, on, on my right here, we have uh, uh, Marcus Brunemeyer. Uh, he is Edward Stanford Professor at Princeton, and he's faculty member of the Department of Economics. Uh, he has been director of the Prince, Princeton Brunenheim Center for Finance, and he's found in, and former director of Princeton Julius Rabinovich Center of Public Policy and Finance. He has been, uh, or he is, research associate in many uh, research centers, such as the NBER, and he's a member of, of many advisory committees. Uh, he holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. To his right, uh, we have the pleasure to have Aurel Schubert, who is Director General of Statistics at the European Central Bank, and he's Chairman of the Statistics Committee of the European System of Central Bank. He's also Chairman of the Contact Group on Data of the European System Risk Board. Uh, previously, he has uh, been working for the Central Bank of Austria for 23 years, 10 of them, or 13 of them, sorry, as Director of Statistics, so he knows a, a bit about statistics. Uh, he's also a member of many advisory committee, and he's honorary professor for economics uh, at the University of Economic and Business in Vienna. He holds a PhD uh, in economics from the University of South Carolina. And then we have uh, two uh, commentators. Uh, at the right of Orel, we have Catherine Henning. Uh, she is senior advisor at the uh, Department of Economic at the Central Bank of Brazil. Uh, she joined the bank in '93. She held various positions and was senior advisor to the board for many years. Uh, before that, she was professor of microeconomic theory and international economics at the Federal University of, of Paraná and uh, the Catholic School of Economic and Management. Um, she is currently vice chair of the Irvin Fisher Committee, and she holds a PhD uh, from the University of São Paulo. And to her right, we have Jan Amador, who is head of the Fiscal Policy and Structural Study Division at the Economic Research Department of Bank of Portugal. He's Associate Professor at the Nova School of Business and Economic, and he was head of the work stream in the ESCB, Competitiveness Research Network, and he's also advisor on many uh, organizations. So as you can see, we have a very competent and high-level panel, and uh, we'll have the two presentations 
Uh, we'll start with Marcus, who's going to tell us a bit what he knows about the liquidity issues and how we're going to solve it today. Up to you. Thanks a lot uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my work here, my thoughts, uh, and outlining my work. It's very good to be here, to be with this high-level group of uh, statisticians. And as an economist, I organized with Arvin Krishnamurti some years back uh, some two NBR conferences where I tried to put together leading economists to write a, text, a book, essentially, to figure out what are the issues, how to conceptualize data collection, what are the issues economists would like to know and create a wish list. And part of this book uh, entered, uh, as I will present today, that's essentially on the risk topography. That's the title of the book as, there as well. And here, focus on the liquidity mismatch aspects. So if you look in history, that you know, one is, of course, there's a lot of data collection. But most of the data collection essentially is focused on levels. Okay? So you have the flow of funds, you have call reports, you have SEC filings, and all that. And in the old days, this was actually a good way to proceed, even if you focused on risk. So if the focus you would like to measure is risk, focusing on the levels and flows is actually a good thing, because in the olden days, risk and flows were always attached with each other. So you got some mortgage, and with the mortgage, there was some default risk. But with the arrival of derivatives, the risk and the flows were actually disconnected. So you have to rethink the measurement of risk. And in particular, your certain concepts like leverage and other things are outdated if you have derivatives in your portfolio. So you have to go and move much more to risk sensitivities. And the focus is then not, not only on particular banks' exposure, or particular entities' exposure, but also on the systemic interaction and the, the price effects. And I will talk more about the latter and this connection. To say this, I think it's important when you focus on systemic risk to distinguish between two components of systemic risk because they have different data requirements. So the first component of systemic risk is that the risk is building up during quiet time. So imbalances, bubbles, and excessive credit is building up. And then it only materializes in time of crisis. For this purpose, to identify that such a thing is occurring, you want to act early on and you want to get some idea. The second component is of systemic risk is then once the crisis happens, then all, everything spills over across asset classes, across countries, across various institutions, and there are all these externalities. And they come also in two flavors, in direct contractual externalities for which you need some exposure positions, some the domino effects, and indirect spillovers, price effects, credit crunch, liquidity spirals. And for this, you need different data as well. So I would like to classify in these three groups, essentially, and what data is good for the first component, what data is good for the second component, and which way we would like to you know, collect data in order to have the ideal data collection. So let me focus on the first aspect. The first aspect essentially comes from the buildup of imbalanced and bubbles. And this is actually much more slow-moving thing, and it's typically the case that you know, people are aware that there's something building up, imbalance are building up, but you, know, you alone would don't want to go against it as an individual arbitrageur or trader, because it's actually more profitable for you to ride the bubble rather than to go against it. So what data would, like, would you like to collect as a regulator in this environment, where you know, the actual measures of risk at the time are not a good indicator at all, because there's a so-called volatility paradox. The volatility paradox says, when actually the volatility seems very low, all the measured volatilities are low, we live in a great moderation, that's exactly the time when this imbalance are building up, because people level up more and take on more risk, even though hidden risk and the volatility you measure is not capturing the hidden risk, which is building up in the background. So to, build, to measure this buildup of potential risk, hidden risk, you need some early warning indicators. And you have to focus on imbalances, or liquidity mismatch concentrations. And I will talk more about this. But it's not important that you know all the position data. And it's also not important that you have it at a daily uh, frequency. So you can have it on a monthly or quarterly frequency. It's actually building up typically at a slower level. So for this part of systemic risk, you know, low-frequency data accumulation is actually pretty good, and it doesn't need to be so fine-tuned and so granular. It's, it's fine if it's less granular. You have to just figure out where is the risk located in the financial system or in the whole economy or in the world economy as a whole. So this is the first component of systemic risk. And you will see in the second component the data requirements are very, very different. 
The second component is essentially the spillovers, contagion, the externalities, once the crisis is at work, what happens, and you would like to know, you know, if one bank fails, how will it impact the other banks and the whole network of banks? Then we need this whom to whom, and who, what are the spillovers, which will, which way will they occur? And the first spillover type of spillover is this domino effects, this interconnectedness effects. And here I've drawn a little bit of a, a network here. That's about a bankruptcy of bank A. How does it lead to a default of this bank? How does it lead to troubles for bank B and the first round, second round, third round effects? And there might be some random recovery rate you want to put in. For this, I think what you need, you need position data. You have to know exactly what are the position data, the legal identifiers, allocation, everything has to be very precise. You want very high frequency data and very detailed data. But I would argue that, you know, if you know this, it's not, you don't capture everything. And it's, you know, an illusion to believe that this, you, if you find a network and the network seems stable, that actually the system is stable. And actually there were many studies in 2007 conducted by central banks I still remember attending a conference saying, oh, the whole system is extremely sound. We run all these externality effects. Because I think what's even more important is essentially the endogenous behavior of people. So first of all, there might be no contractual links at all. Nevertheless, the huge spillovers. There can be in form of information spillovers. Suddenly, we learn something. And suddenly, it also affects this default in Russia, leads to default in Brazil, like what we experienced in 1998. And, but more importantly, there will be price effects. And the price effects, many different firms have similar position. And even though they have no contractual links, they hold similar position, the price goes down, and they have a common exposure. And the spirals, then they will both fire sell at the same time. And this will actually amplify things. And they actually are virtually connected. So even though there are no direct links, I think they are virtual links. And let me just draw a connection here. So I have in this table, I have two columns. The first one is the direct uh, spillover effects, the contractual links, a loss through a bank's bankruptcy. But you also have indirect virtual links, which you, you don't have any contractual links at all, but you just have similar exposure, or you're linked to some virtual means, which are you know to the behavior of, of things. And what's different, for the direct links, you can have this position data. For the indirect links, you really need to know how people behave to a shock. Is it the case when they get the shock, they see the price goes down, they see it as a great buying opportunity, they go in and stabilize the system. So certain people act as a shock absorber, while other entities in the economy act as shock amplifiers. So to figure out who will act as a shock absorber and who will act as a shock amplifier. So here I have drawn the shock absorbers as the green ones and the amplifiers as the red ones. If you have shock absorbers, they are stabilize the system and your distribution stays nicely, let's say, normally distributed. But if you have the shock amplifiers, you have these fat tails appearing, which endogenously appearing, and that there's an endogenous risk building up and then showing up in times of crisis. So the, the focus I would like to give in this talk, essentially, to really focus on some indicators, which give us some indicator, will these firms, when a shock occurs, amplify the risk or absorb the risk? Take it out and absorb it and stabilize the system, or make it even worse? And I think that's the key to understand. Of course, this now brings together the first element of systemic risk, which is about the build-up phase. The build-up phase, you can think of a phase where many of the entities turn from absorbers into amplifiers in a hidden way. You don't observe it right away, but you have to get some indication who is still an absorber and who is switched already to become an amplifier. And what we argue here is that in order to get a good indicator, whether you're an amplifier or an absorber, it would be wise to look at the liquidity mismatch index. So it's not necessarily the maturity mismatch. It is the liquidity mismatch. What matters at the asset side is not necessarily the maturity, but how easily you can sell it off. So if, for example, if you have 30-year treasuries, US treasuries, and you fund it overnight with repo funding, that's a huge maturity mismatch. But it's not really a big problem because the treasuries in times of crisis would appreciate in value, and then actually you could easily sell them off. So they are a safe asset, and it's not of an issue. So you really have to focus on the liquidity mismatch. The maturity mismatch will give you the, the wrong indication. 
in addition, if you think about where does the illiquidity really come from on the asset side, it comes ultimately from some technological illiquidity. Ultimately, it will be the case that the economy wants to fund some firms, some construction, some houses, people want to build houses, and these things are illiquid, and people want to save in very liquid instruments. So ultimately what you have, you have people who want to have liquid instruments, savings, and they have, there is some building and construction going on which is irreversible, you can't undo it so simply. Okay, so you have these two extremes, and then the financial system is doing something in the middle around it. Okay, but you have to always start, the economy needs some liquidity mismatch because there's a need for having liquid savings, and on the other hand, there is um, a need for having building up a 30 year uh, factory, which has a maturity or a factory, and which cannot be easily converted into some, some other things, so it is essentially illiquid. Again, from a market liquidity perspective, it depends very much, it's, from a micro potential perspective, if you look at market liquidity, what is the price impact if you fire sell an asset? You can think of it as an exogenous variable. There's a discount of 20%. From a micro potential perspective, it depends who else is holding this and the other owners of these assets, how are they funded? If everybody else is funded with very solid long-term funding, then when the price goes down, the others will jump in and stabilize the price. So the market liquidity is very high but if the others are you know, also highly levered and have very short-term funding, then it will be the case that the price will give in a lot. So this market liquidity is an endogenous variable uh, as well. So coming back to the liquidity mismatch, that's it. the liquidity mismatch index, what it tries to capture, it tries to capture on the asset side how much market liquidity on all these assets the, the bank or any entity has and how is it funded in, on the funding side, what is the price impact in terms when the crisis occurs, and how long is the funding arrangement on the liability side? Now, you would like to know two things. First, you would like to know what is the aggregate liquidity mismatch in the economy, but equally importantly, you, what's the distribution in the economy and in the financial sector? I mentioned already, in aggregate, there will be some firms and households that want to build a a fabric or some firm, I want to build some houses, so there is some long run thing which you know, requires funding for 30, 40, 50 years. And then there are households on the other extreme which have some short term deposits. Uh, they would like to have this flexibility, they have short term deposits whenever they have a healthcare expenditure, they can actually make use of that. So there is in the system a built in a liquidity mismatch which is not necessarily bad and it it might be excessive, but it's actually natural, it's part of the economic system to serve this uh, liquidity mismatch because a lot of these shocks will be idiosyncratic shocks for these households and you can insure against them. The question is then, who is holding this? Is this in the financial sector? How is the financial sector dealing with it? Is it diversified away? Is there a long intermediation chain? Is there a short intermediation chain? And how concentrated is it in certain sectors? So for example, the financial sector can actually push some of the liquidity risk towards the corporate sector by saying, okay, we only give you short-term loans for your fabric, and then it will be the case that the most of the liquidity mismatch is in the corporate sector. Or the mortgage structure may change to so push the liquidity mismatch into the housing sector. And, and you will have to find out where this thing is, not only within the financial sector, but it might also be pushed some in certain periods towards uh, certain sectors in the economy. The most important thing is in the distribution is to figure out whether there are some risk pockets or liquidity risk pockets which uh, are concentrated in a particular subsection of the financial sector, which also makes the whole thing a subject to runs. So you uh, want, to make, want to understand when is there a system designed in such a way that it's subject to runs because you have, this financial sector has promised something which is you know, subject to runs given its asset structure. And uh, as I mentioned before, this re response indicator is very, very different between somebody who has a deep pocket, he rides out a liquidity shortage, he sees this as a great buying opportunity and stabilizes the price. If it's a fickle investor who is highly levered in the fire sales, he will contribute to with further sales. And this endogenous response is very hard to capture purely from position data. You really have to figure out and work on the position data and all the funding structure to figure this out. So here I drew again the market liquidity and the funding liquidity, so some particular implementation 
how one uh, could do it. So the market liquidity, again, what is the price at which you can sell if there's a fire sale? The funding liquidity, uh, how often you have to roll over your debt, how short term is your debt? And equ equally important is just a different language, how stable are the margins? If the margins are very stable, then it's like long-term funding. If the margins can jump up and down, they are very insensitive, but then it's like uh, very, very uh, short-term funding, okay? So that's, so stable margins means long-term funding, non-stable margins means essentially uh, very short-term funding. Then you have suddenly problems in the financial markets, fire sales kicking in, and so forth. So the liquidity mismatch index measures the liquidity of the assets and the asset sides, the market liquidity, and subtracts the funding liquidity you promised to others uh, from the liability side. So how would you do it? So one, op uh, one way to do it and uh, it's just to say, okay, we have to assign a certain lambda for all the positions. So we go through the positions balance sheet and say, okay, there's a certain lambda we assign to it. There's a price discount if lambda is one. There's no price discount because the U.S. Treasuries are German bonds. And then if it's overnight repo, it has a different lambda and so forth. You, you assign a lambda to all the various positions. And you also assign a, a lambda on all the liability sides, depending you know, how much you want to subtract. If it's equity funded, then you subtract 0.1 times equity. If it's overnight debt funding, then you have to subtract a much larger number. So these numbers are just made up. They're not uh, calibrated to anything at this point. And, and you have to keep in mind that these lambdas themselves are indulgent as a part of a fixed point system. It depends who is holding these positions and what is the expectations, you know, whether this US Treasury will stay a safe asset or not. So you have to take this into account. And you can nest this approach in, in various uh, regulatory approaches as well, but this would be a more general approach. And I'm glad to see that the, that the Bundesbank is actually taking the lead here and implementing this uh, risk topography in, in their, using their own data, the regulatory data, to make use of this uh, framework to figure out what is the response, to get the response indicator and uh, take this into account in their liquidity risk measurement exercise. So what you would like to know is some liquidity mismatch uh, map or topography. You could want like to get the aggregate perspective, how irreversible is the investment from the firms and the household side, and how much is it financed in short-term debt, and how much is it pushed actually to the real sector, how much is it concentrated in the financial sector, and in the financial sector, where in the financial sector is it concentrated. Do you have very short-term uh, intermediation chains or very long-term intermediation changes? Is there some hidden uh, plans there? And what's important, I think, is whether certain plans are mutually inconsistent. So it could be that, you know, you consider a situation where you say, my risk management strategy is if the price drops, I will fire sell my assets. And that's, I take 10% into account. And if that's fine, if there are only a few guys following this risk management strategy, but if everybody's following the same risk management strategy, it actually means the price will not drop 10%, but 20, 30%. So you have to figure out what people believe, what market participants believe, at what price they can get out, and is this mutually consistent? And typically market participants don't have the aggregate knowledge how the funding structure of other people is in order to have a good idea how big the price impact will be. So let me uh, mention some complication which might occur is that you might say, oh, this lambdas that might move around and they depend uh, very much, you know, how bad the situation is. So there's some liquidity risk on top of it. And what I talked so far is just there's one lambda in times of crisis. You can actually generalize this method and you can say, okay, I have various lambdas depending what stress scenario I take into account. So you can look across various scenarios and say, okay, for various scenarios, I have a different set of lambdas. So then you get the whole distribution of potential uh, lambdas and hence potential price impacts and also how the funding structure will move across these various uh, scenarios. Um, so what, in particular, what we proposed is, is, is a following two-step approach. So it's like you split the task into two tasks, and one part is done to some extent by the financial industry, and the other part is done then by the regulatory community. So as I mentioned, you would like to figure out how various players will react to a shock. And the first task is to say, okay, let's have a partial equilibrium response to an 
orthogonal stress factor. So there's one stress factor, something is, the system is stressed, and one has to figure out how much does the value, the market value of particular firms is changing, or the positions are changing, and how much is the liquidity mismatch index of this particular entity changing. And from this, we can then figure out what is the response of this particular player. So if the value goes down a lot and the liquidity mismatch index wasn't significantly as well, you would say, oh, these guys will fire a cell. If at the same time it is a negative shock, the liquidity mismatch index stays very stable or is even improving, then these guys will act as a stabilizer. But the idea is essentially to ask market participants to report this change in their value and this change in liquidity mismatch index to get an idea um, how individual market participants will react to that. So over long, in the long run, you collect this on a monthly basis, and then you actually get, in the long run, you get some panel data set, and you can then figure out from repeated behavior how they will react to changes to that. And then in a the second step, you take individual reaction functions, and you put it in a general equilibrium in order to figure out how big is the amplification and the persistence. That's where the macro potential component comes in. So you have this micro potential component in the first stage where the financial industry is feeding in and the micro potential regulators helping to figure things out. And then you put it in a general equilibrium to figure out how this whole macro potential aspects are playing out. So let me give you a particular example. So let's suppose there is you know, a drop in, let's say, mortgage-backed securities uh, of 5%, 10%, 15%. And we ask each market participants, you know, how will this affect your value? How, how much will the value go down? And how will this affect your liquidity mismatch index? Not the maturity mismatch, but the liquidity mismatch index. And then there's the predicted response. Will this guy hold out? He will just stick to his thing? Uh, or he will fire sale and there will be a credit crunch. He will not give new loans. He will just, you know, stop his activity making it worse for others. See, there's no direct connection. It's just this one firm is hit. And it's not giving new loans to some other firms, and the other firms are hit as well. But let's suppose we want to figure out how this guy or this entity will behave and respond to this shock. Now you take this from, from all uh, these market participants, and you put it in an indirect equilibrium response. And then you can, from this, you can figure out, let's suppose, the direct response to 5%, we figured out, oh, if 5% decline of mortgage-backed securities it will lead to fire sales by many, many market participants, then you say, actually, 5% is not so realistic. It has to drop down 10 15% at least, because given the behavioral response of the others, it will be the case that the price will drop much more. And the way you figure this out is essentially are these plans, everybody's plans on everybody's response, is this mutually consistent? Or in other words, are all these response functions do they form a general equilibrium or not? Well, that's essentially what's going on in uh, this data collection exercise. And you should capture then by this all the nonlinearities, the externalities we talked about, and also multiple equilibria, which can occur because of runs. So let me. I uh, mentioned just uh, some details here. You have to think about, I just took one stress scenario. So the question is, there are many detailed questions you have to figure out. What is the stress scenario I want to focus on? So you need some core data for the panel set, and you would like to calibrate this response function to always do the same stress scenario every month to get an idea you want to have for a panel data a connection. You want to have some consistency about that. On the other hand, you, want, you also would like to have every time you would like to have some particular special cases, which are especially relevant at that point in time. So you take some of this mix of these two uh, into account. But you would like to have some key core st uh, strategies or response function to core stress scenarios into our account. So let me come to the conclusion. So what I wanted to point out in, in this, uh, this little speech is that there are two components of systemic risk, and the data requirements are very different in these components. Of course, there's some overlapping in both of them. The first, the build-up phase, and the second, in the crisis, the spillover phase. But the difference is the frequency in the build-up can be very low frequency. You don't need this high-frequency data. So low frequency is good enough, as long as people report averages and not snapshots, and there's some window dressing involved with that. So, uh, so and low granularity is actually also fine. What you really need is this liquidity mismatch uh, pockets to get this idea where is the liquidity mismatch concentrated in the whole economy and also within the financial system. 
Once the spillovers occur, then you would like suddenly like to have much more detailed uh, granular information, position data to correct for direct spillover effects. But importantly, again, this indulgence response indicators, and we propose this liquidity mismatch index, which gives you some indication how will people behave to it. It can be that there's huge exposures across the system. If they don't react to it and there's no amplification through the reaction, it's not a big deal. So to have the, some indication along this line is very, very important. So the data collection, you would like to collect uh, liquidity mismatch data from the balance sheets, from all market participants, ideally, and focus also how the liquidity mismatch is distributed, not just the aggregate liquidity mismatch, but how is it distributed across the whole economy and the financial system. And then you use the general equilibrium model as a second step to figure out whether certain liquidation strategies are mutually inconsistent in general equilibrium. And when they're mutually inconsistent, they lead to amplification. Hence, the initial shock you gave was probably too small. You have to assume a bigger shock to make it a consistent general equilibrium framework. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for this very comprehensive and insightful presentation. For those of you that thought that uh, liquidity mismatch was a simple matter, I think you're convinced that it's a complex issue. But we have now a framework and needs for more data. That's good. Now we're going to switch to uh, a slightly different perspective. Uh, Royal is going to present us uh, the home to whom uh, framework and some of its use uh, in, in uh, the uh, ECB. Aurel. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, uh, Louis Marc already said I'm not going to say now where the data is coming from for uh, for for Marcus's model. Uh, what I'm doing here is now to give you some information. Where do we stand with whom to whom uh, or the who to whom? Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm the who or the whom, but I will simply present where we are. And I want to give you a little bit uh, a flavor of the work that is currently done um, uh, in the ECB and the Euro system by, by my colleagues. And I'm just uh, reporting about all, all this work. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the IMF and the, and the Bundesbank for the invitation. It's a big honor and pleasure for me to present uh, this, this work. Now, having listened to uh, Professor Ising this morning, I'm really glad to report that uh, ECB statistics in 2015 are uh, fundamentally different from 1998, uh, if you heard what he was saying. So I can say, uh, gladly report what a difference 17 years make in terms of statistics. So we are fortunately completely somewhere else than uh, what he was uh, uh, reporting this morning. Now, uh, briefly, what I will say is a little bit of background, so the theory and methodology a little bit, and then come into the question of the production. And just in the previous panel, we also saw production and uses. Uh, so in production, uh, the data sources, and then the data uses. Uh, here, uh, distinguishing uh, three different uh, potential uh, important uh, data uh, usages by different policy functions within the central bank, namely monetary policy, financial stability, and macroprudential and financial integration, and then come uh, to uh, some, some conclusions. Now, Professor Ising also said this morning that uh, the crisis was the biggest turning point for official statistics, and uh, among other things, because the need for much more data on uh, in networks, interconnectedness, that's what we call here whom, who to whom. Um, and it is, uh, I mean, he just mentioned it en passant, but it was actually him who was chairing this commission he was talking about in 2008, 2009, which is known as the Ising Commission, which suggested, for instance, to build a global risk map. And if you look into the report of the Ising Commission, which uh, Professor Ising sent me a few weeks ago, um, he unearthed it somewhere. It's interesting to see that, uh, two of, two, for instance, another member on this commission was a a gentleman called Jens Weidmann, and the other one was Mr. Asmus, and so these were uh, so these were high caliber people who suggested to build up global risk maps. We're obviously not there. And I'm not going to pre uh, present to their global risk map, but I can say a few things what has happened in the meantime uh, in in Europe. Now it was already mentioned that. Uh, the data gaps initiative, the first data gaps initiative, so I don't have to go into any details, and you definitely 
you'll not be able to read this behind the third row, but the recommendation 15 was exactly as it was said today, uh, to develop further sector data flow funds data, and then also to go more into uh, sectoral balance sheets data and the different data categories. So that's exactly uh, what we are uh, working on and uh, what the Professor Ising was also referring to. So uh, I can say that sector accounts provide already a rather rough indicator and in showing this building up of imbalances, uh, hopefully that what uh, uh, Professor um, Brunemeyer just mentioned. So in good times, you see already building up of uh, imbalances, uh, but you could ask why didn't we see it or why didn't we look at that uh, back then in 2007, 2006. But that is already somewhere where you see already that debt to income ratios might be changing. There are maturity mismatches in the financial sector developing. So the sector accounts provide an, an information framework that uh, supports the joint analysis of macroeconomic and macro uh, prudential uh, analysis and then potentially policies. However, for a real in-depth analysis of the financial linkages among the different uh, economies and the different sectors, you require information on who are the counterparties behind the transactions uh, or behind the positions. And so you need this data on, on who to whom, and that is uh, the topic for, for today. Now, very, very briefly, just if this changes, uh, just a, a graph on, on just a little bit on the, on the theory. On the left side, you see the column where you see basically the, the sequence of the integrated financial and non-financial accounts. On the top, you see the production sector. Then you see income distribution and use within and across the sectors. Then you see there you have sector savings and capital transfers, which then lead to the capital formation by each sector, and the result is then the net lending or net borrowing. And here we show then we go to the different sectors. You see the household sector, you see the government sector, the non-financial corporation sector, and the financial corporation sectors. And the rest is then the, the rest of the world, you know, the current account and the rest of the world. And this is a fully equivalent then to the financial transactions within a time period. That is the middle bar on the right-hand side, where you see the financial tra transactions of the household the non-financial corporations, government, financial corporations, and the rest of the world. So here you can develop from the opening balance sheets with the financial transactions, then taking into account revaluations and other changes, you come to the closing uh, balance sheets. And that is basically the basis how you can now build up this uh, who-to-whom information. So one more chart on this, just simplifying now, just zooming into the household sector, otherwise there would be no, no way that you would uh, see the whole story. But you see, if you look at the balance sheet of the household sector, you see for every asset there is a counterpart, and on the same uh, token for every liability there is a counterpart. So here we have just highlighted, so for your, uh, for your asset, the first bar on the left, the counterpart is a non-financial corporation. So you are holding an asset which is maybe an equity of a non-financial corporation or a, or a, a corporate bond, for instance. Or uh, the, then going below, you have as a counterpart the financial intermediary. So this could be something like a, uh, where you hold a deposit at a financial intermediary or you hold a, a bank bond. So these are basically, so for every asset, uh, you have a counterpart and for every liability, you have a counterpart. So this is basically uh, the theoretical framework in which we are uh, uh, working here. And so now the question is, what are the sources now for this kind of information? Now, uh, what are the main sources and uh, obviously as I say in a second they are of different quality and different extent. So first of all um, information on sectors and other counterparties. Uh, we have for the financial institutions, for the banks uh, and other financial institutions there are easily available from statistical reporting. We have very, very well developed uh, balance sheet information uh, on, different statistic, uh, on different financial institutions. We'll come back to that later on. So that is pretty well developed. For the general government, we can also say in the euro area the availability is, is rather good. We have reporting with full counterparty details, not yet as a norm, not in all countries, but the, the coverage is rather good. Now, for the non-financial corporations and the households, this is much more difficult. This is a much bigger challenge here, how to, how to get uh, to the right information. And here we have obviously still challenges uh, uh, to deal with, and I come back to, to some of the answers which we are trying uh, uh, to have here. Now, um, so an almost complete who to whom matrix of transactions can be uh, compiled for many financial uh, instruments 
every asset in a sector, as I said before, is a liability in some other sector. So this is, this is good. Now then we have the balancing and the residual approaches for those cells which we don't have. So here we have to do estimations, uh, calculations, use the experience, the knowledge, and other sources to do something about it. So data on the who-to-whom basis would be preferable to cover both financial transactions and outstanding amounts. So we are want both stocks and flows, ideally, and uh, we have fortunately a lot of that. And uh, what we should not forget, and that was this, this one line I had in between, these are revaluation effects or non-transactions, because especially during the financial crisis, if you look at the data, Price effects were enormously important. So there might be very few transactions, but very strong changes in prices, which lead to changes in the positions uh, uh, of the different sectors. And these questions are obviously very important, especially, but not just for uh, uh, financial stability purposes. Now, uh, a little bit more on uh, on the uh, data production side, we had a heard already today a lot about aggregate data versus granular data. Now, aggregate uh, data collection by uh, individual institutions who aggregate their positions, as we heard today, and the transactions into instruments, into sectors, into residency that we have, that exists, is quite developed. Now, the granular data collection as a means loan by loan, security by security, trade by trade, transaction by transaction, Professor Ising mentioned, for instance, the money market statistical reporting, which we'll introduce next year. This will be really transaction by transaction, so potentially 50, 70,000 transactions uh, uh, per day. So this is this more going granular. Now, the ESA or SNA framework, or the System of National Accounts, or the Euro -Syst European System of Accounts, uh, here, aggregated data collection might be enough and the data is collected from financial institutions also as custodians of security. So there you get already some who to whom information uh, if they are a custodians. But if you really want to have a full uh, who to whom matrices, you need more specialized information. You need simply more granular information. So this trend to go granular is simply is necessary if you really want a full blown uh, who to whom. Maybe more, uh, it's clear the, the aggregated information has a long history and the costs are also rather limited. The granular information on a, on a different, as we heard already today also, also uh, is, uh, allows much more sophisticated analysis. It allows the flexibility to address new user needs. Uh, for instance, the mentioning was today of Lehman Brothers, and when on the 15th of uh, September 2008, Lehman Brothers went down, the next day came the emails from the ECB to the national central banks, you know, how much Lehman Brothers papers are you holding at home? And as uh, Professor Ising mentioned already, in some countries that was not a big problem, in other countries couldn't answer the question because there was this information in a disaggregated form uh, not, not, not avail available. However, and there is the cost aspect, we'll come back to that uh, in, in a moment again, setting up granular data uh, collections might be very costly. I would see it more as an investment than as a running cost because the running cost is also with security. Security reporting showed the running cost might be much lower, but you need initial investment. So this extra cost we think is, is justified when because the use is, especially when the use is for different purposes. So this multi-purpose use, which was already also mentioned today, which allows the micro data, the granular data allows you to address different questions in different areas. So I'll bring just quickly a few examples which we have in the Euro area. So one is security by security reporting, which we have introduced. Uh, uh, here we have basically two databases which help here, the one on the left-hand side for the question who has issued what, so who are the debtors. So here we have the centralized securities database with about seven million securities which are held or traded in Europe. Who is the issuer? What kind of uh, security is it? What are the maturities? Is it fixed rate, uh, variable, etc.? You see here you have the identification of the issuer, you have the, uh, the instrument, you have the amounts outstanding, you have the daily prices of this. On the other side, which is the newer 
um, newer thing, the newer database, which we have now for, for the last uh, three years, is the question, who holds what? So the security holder statistics, which also uh, Professor Ising mentioned uh, this morning. Here we have then uh, uh, the holding data, the holding amounts, the, the, the names, uh, the entity names, etc. And then when we match the two together, then we really get a picture of the whole securities market, who is uh, who has issued what and who is who is holding what. Now the next area, if you go down the balance sheet, uh, uh, is obviously the next big asset is then uh, the loans, the credits. And here that's the origin of a project uh, which we are all and many in this room are very much involved in. And the good news from last night is that our governing council has decided uh, that we are now uh, at least able to publish our current draft regulation in this area. Here the idea is now also for credits to go loan by loan. Many countries have already such databases, are using them either for supervisory purposes or for um, macroeconomic or financial stability purposes. Here the idea is now for the euro area and for those countries of the EU who will join to develop such an analytical uh, credit uh, database and uh, we are just uh, developing the first stage which will only serve um, traditional central banking purposes, so monetary policy, macroprudential purposes, not yet microprudential purposes. Those will come at a, at a later uh, point. But uh, this project had a lot of and has a lot of headwind, especially in this, in this country. If you had been here in the last few weeks, almost every day you would have seen an article in the newspapers about the ECB or the Bundesbank uh, being uh, what they call Datenkrake, which is uh, this animal with about polyp with about eight arms, which is trying to collect something which nobody needs. Now I hope uh, you, at least in this room, are convinced that this data is, 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 is useful and important in order to answer some of those questions, for instance, which uh, uh, Professor Brunnenmeier just uh, mentioned a moment ago. So going now from the sources and the methodology quickly to the uses and show you a few examples uh, of the use of, uh, of this kind of information. So the, uh, the uh, who to whom data enables, for instance, the mapping of funding channels, something that was very, very important. So how are the different sectors of the economy being funded? Uh, are there credit supply restrictions or not? Or analyzing portfolio behavior and rebalancing of portfolios, again, something that is very important for the monetary transmission mechanism. If you think about the whole question of quantitative easing, where we talk about portfolio rebalancing, that is the idea that you know, the banks uh, sell their government bonds and lend to the, to, the, uh, to the real economy. Here you can now check, is this happening or is it not happening? So you can uh, look at, and I will not go to all the details, but these are the kind of questions which you can now answer, which are relevant for monetary policy because, as we heard with the crisis, you have this enormous heterogeneity. Although we have only one monetary policy, how the monetary policy arrives in the different euro area countries is very different, both from country to country, but even from sector to sector and within the sectors from institution to institution. And so here, um, this helps. So here is just uh, two pictures. For instance, the question, what is the contribution? Because it was also mentioned in the, in the program about shadow banking or the non-bank. Uh, what is the contribution of the non-banks to financing non-financial corporations? And you just look uh, here at the right-hand corner, you see pretty much zero or negative if you look at loans. But if you have more detailed data and you look also at securities, the story looks very different. And here suddenly, non-banks are main contributors to the capital market funding of non-financial corporations in the euro area. So again, something which you can only see uh, from this kind of who to whom data. Here, a little bit more complicated, so I will not go into any details. What you see here is uh, price changes, holding gains. If there is a decrease by 100 basis points in the yields of government debt securities, what is the effect of that? on different holdings of government bonds. And it makes a difference whether you're holding Austrian bonds or you're holding Irish bonds. For instance, the, the changes in prices, as you see on the left-hand side, for a, a German, as for Austrian or Dutch bonds, they increase much more in value than Irish bonds, for instance, in this case. And you have it here for different sectors. Again, something relevant for, uh, uh, for, for financial stability purposes. Then, uh, I have five more minutes, that should be fine. I move on 
to uh, financial stability and macro prudential. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, what kind of information? Again, here we are talking about monitoring risks and vulnerabilities. You just heard a moment ago uh, how, how, how we are trying here uh, to analyze different kind of links. So here, uh, risks. And here the important thing is what are the linkages, the linkages at the firm level, so the who to whom. Uh, there we go now much more granular because they are important for financial stability purposes. So if, for instance, risks emerge in one sector or subsector, that might be very quickly propagated, as you just saw uh, in the previous presentation, again, to other other sectors, so you might have collateral damage or, or here um, a propagation between sectors. So again, here sector level, whom to whom data provide a useful first indication, but if you go down really to who to whom data, then you can much better monitor financial risks as the simple sector specific balance sheets uh, overlook the distribution of risks which are behind these and it overlooks the interconnectedness potentially between different institutions. So all kinds of network analysis of cross-sectional linkages, again, they are possible and potentially possible once you have a, a who to whom data. So here are just a few, few graphs. Here you just see interconnectedness among euro area sectors. For instance, on the loan side, you see on the left that obviously not surprisingly, the MFIs, so the banks, are the main contributors, loans to the non-financial corporations. This is this one uh, vertical line or the, to the, um, going to the right. Uh, here you have also the uh, MFIs uh, um, giving, uh, again, financing via loans. On the deposit side, obviously, the picture looks quite different where you have the households in the right-hand corner uh, being the more uh, most uh, developing or giving loans, uh, having deposits, sorry, having deposits at the bank. So again, here you see the thickness of the line shows the interconnectedness between uh, uh, the, these sectors. Uh, here is, for instance, interconnectedness among your area sectors. Uh, again, something you can look at uh, with our data is now with securities. So how is the how is the interconnectedness with debt securities, with listed shares, with investment fund shares? Again, I will not go into the detail, but again, you find here, again, with the thickness of the bars, how strong are the interconnectedness uh, here. And the interesting then, obviously, is this question, not just la pour la, but what happens if there is a shock? And here uh, you see then again two different models where the shocks might have completely different consequences. On the left side, we have somewhere where the, where the shares are mainly held within the country. On the right-hand side, they are mainly held in the rest of the world. So the right-hand side is, so to speak, the good picture because you are exporting your problem to somebody else. The left-hand side, it's more left in the domestic uh, economy. And then as the last part is financial integration. This is also our mandate of the, of the ECB to do something on financial integration. Again, here, who to whom data are very useful to show uh, how the integration, which means the cross-border cross border investment, cross border borrowing and lending, how is this developing? It's also something very relevant for a new policy area of the European Union, namely the Capital Markets Union, which was just launched a, a few months ago. Again, here, if we want to have answers whether it's going to work, uh, who to whom data uh, might be very helpful. So here is just to show you over time, before the crisis and uh, basically now, how has the cross-border funding in the euro area changed? You will not see here now um, the, the countries, but uh, you can look at it uh, in your, I'm sure you have a printout of it, but you see uh, the strong changes and for instance, uh, um, so how, how numbers or how the interconnectedness between certain countries has gone down uh, very much. On the very right hand side, you see in the first, in 2007, a very thick uh, line which disappears afterwards, that's between the Netherlands and Belgium, because the biggest financial institution which was combining the two countries disappeared in the meantime. So here we have a very strong changes. But again, it shows you something about interconnectedness. And the last picture uh, is a different story, but again, which you can use here. It simply shows our euro area debt instruments or more equity instruments held in other parts of the world. The darker the picture, the more it is uh, debt-oriented, the lighter the picture, the more euro area equity is held by these countries. Obviously, the quantities behind that is, is obviously very different, whether it's the US or it is uh, uh, the Ivory Coast, but it just shows you a little bit about where the, where the preferences are. So again, something about more global financial integration. So to come to the end, uh, to the conclusions, I think 
um, the data gaps revealed that uh, data on who to whom basis is of very high importance and it's very high list on closing the data gaps. So, and especially the new world of non-standard monetary policy measures here um, and, and the close interrelationship between monetary policy and macroprudential policies, and some people say you cannot separate the two anymore. I mean, they are very strongly linked. Also, this has heightened the importance of, of this, this kind of who to whom uh, data. Now, it might be costly, but uh, we think it is uh, worth the effort because it gives you enormous flexibility to drill down into details and find some of those answers maybe uh, which uh, uh, Professor Brunemeyer the most questioning as I will had the, the, the questions. Uh, and also to look at uh, things like ultimate risk basis, you can only do this uh, from granular data. So uh, I think uh, it is uh, worth it and we try to and we try to show that is also technically and institutionally viable. And now even with uh, enlarging our portfolio to micro supervision, again, these questions become more and more relevant. To finish here, so this is one answer to a question which was or a, a statement which was also made by Professor Ising, this whole philosophy of collect data only once and then reuse it for different purposes. And the more granular you are, the better you can uh, reuse it. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, with that, I can finish and say as a last word uh, that I think we are also proud that, as I showed, this was one of the requests of the Data Gaps Initiative, but it is also part of the SDDS Plus. And so the good news that uh, out of the nine countries which have fulfilled the SDDS Plus, seven are from uh, the Euro area, has also to do with uh, we have developed uh, these kind of things. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Aurel, for this uh, very interesting presentation showing the use of uh, granular data. Uh, coming back to Professor Ising's statement this morning, uh, we have to think always in terms of cost-benefit when we deal with new uh, statistic uh, tools or instrument. And the cost has been repeated all along today that it's very expensive to invest in those either big data or new data series, but you have demonstrated that there's some benefit and user uh, have uh, the last word on this. And uh, now we're gonna turn to our first discussion, Catherine, who's gonna t discuss the two papers. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a very big, do not touch here. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the gentle invitation to participate in this forum. It's a great opportunity to discuss these subjects that are up-to-date, a little bit uh, different one from the other one, but I see this as the big topics that we should discuss for the future. And so the roadmap of my presentation is this. Uh, first, I will just draw a scenario, and then after, I will highlight some points of each presentation, uh, raise some questions, some doubts that I had when I read the papers in the presentation, and then I will draw some final considerations that are more uh, opinions than, than uh, something that I'm, are my own opinions, it's not something that it's a consensus. And first, So, uh, when I entered the central bank some, um, some years ago, not so long, <laughs> but so we used to think about the market and the regulators as specific regulators for each market. And then we hope that each market participant does work, do their, uh, use their, uh, draw their strate strategy inside their own markets. And then the role that we expect from the regulator was that he uh, raised some rules that limit the actions of these uh, market participants uh, to keep them sound. And then if the market participant was sound, we suppose that the market was stable and then the system was stable. And then everything was in order, everybody has done his job, and then we will uh, live safe and secure. But what we have done, what we have seen during last years was that the interconnected connectiveness, and this is the big word I think that we heard from time to time today and in our job, 
So uh, increases a lot. It means that each market participant organize their strategy, think their strategy, using different instruments from this own market, uh, using instruments from other markets, and now using instruments for other countries and other currencies. It means that being a regulator from one market in one country, it's very, very difficult and to raise rules to uh, keep them uh, safe and sound. Uh, began to be much more difficult, and then they need uh, to work uh, one with the other one. And then they need to get uh, statistics. I remember very much in the, cri when the, in the uh, onset of the crisis in 2008 in Brazil, for example, that the, s the financial system was very sound. But then we discovered some specific transactions, and, and then we needed to know if those transactions would uh, vary limited to some specific enterprise or if it was a split around the economy. And then we discovered, hopefully, that it was very much restricted. And then we looked to the liquidity uh, in the market and we discovered that it was very much liquid. But who had liquidity? Keep them for himself. And then it means that they, the liquidity was hoarded and we wanted to, uh, so the central market, the central bank needed to raise some measures to spread the liquidity across the market. For this, the first question is how you uh, define liquidity. And, and then some, uh, some years after, I took part in a task force organized by the BIS, uh, trying to raise measures to uh, raise indices to measure the liquidity. And the first task was to define liquidity. And then, uh, now, then I get to uh, uh, Professor Brunenmeier uh, paper that uh, he, uh, he uh, defined liquidity as a net of a liquidity of assets measured through the market value of the assets that are, are hoarded uh, and the liquidity promised through the liabilities of each agent. And then it's a very interesting uh, indicator because it's an indicator of the uh, liquid, uh, of the net liquidity, liquidity that, at, uh, that any agent has. And then after defining this, he was, he's able to sum up uh, the liquidity mismatch from one specific sector and then, pass, and then compare this with other sectors and, and see where are the problems, where are the mismatches. And uh, reading the paper uh, from 2012, I guess, and, and then he draw those uh, lambdas because he doesn't measure the liquidity mismatch in a very calm period. The liquid, what you can raise, what each uh, enterprise can raise uh, from cash in a calm, very calm period is completely different from the cash that they can raise when they are facing a stress. And then, so then they propose uh, to measure this index in different states of the economy, and they try to measure it in the worst state, in the most stressful state of the economy that they could, and to, to understand where are the risks and the contagions risks. And this was really, so I was very much excited with this. I was just uh, uh, very curious how to measure. I'm very glad to know that Bundesbank is trying to do this. And I have seen that he um, defined some lambda, and I guess that, but this lambda that he shows in the slide, uh, each one lambda for each kind of paper could change in the period, and could change from one sector to the other, because the pension funds doesn't want to give up some, some kind of securities that they keep, while the banks gave up this kind of security very quickly. And then I imagine that the, you have, uh, so, it's possible to have different lambdas for different sectors in different moments. And then you need to judge the lambda that you use in each situation. All what I'm saying is that the idea it's great to implement, it should not be easy, but. And, and so then it's a, it's a very interesting concept, uh, link it to one specific period that uh, will bring, uh, that ask about ca uh, cash. And the, the big issues that I, so the, the most difficult things uh, to, to deal with while implementing this was 
uh, the concept of liquidity adopted, this is interesting, and how to aggregate the assets and liabilities of in one participant analysis, so which lambda that you use in each situation, then after, how they will aggregate this uh, across institutions and use it, and for example, put this inside Oro's map. And if they want to draw home to home uh, the balance sheet from each sector, as Oro showed, how they will manage to do this. And then after, uh, so if the, if the government has any role in this, because usually the government try uh, to help the situations to uh, stabilize the situation. And if the government uh, participate, decide to participate, what kind of measure the government will take because he's talking preemptively. It's not when the situation already arises. He can already raise some propositions for the government to act. It's a very, very interesting proposition. Okay, and then my questions to him are, uh, does LMI have a time dimension, so it should be measured uh, quarterly, yearly, uh, daily? Well, he mentioned that daily is not necessary. What is the relevant time frame for liquidity? How to automatize estimation? And would the net sum of the singular LMI hide an important individual mismatch? Because always when we aggregate index, then uh, some negative ones uh, compensate some positive. And about Oro's paper, so uh, one of the most difficult tasks that I have seen in my, uh, in my department is to build the home-to-home -home, uh, matrix. I'm very glad to say that Brazil already uh, published the annual um, uh, financial accounts until 2014, 2013, and then we will uh, finish 2014 and 15 next year, and then make it quarterly. But what are the difficulties there? It's really about sharing data. It's getting the data from a, a lot of uh, different sources, convince them that they should give us the data in the way that we need. And then it's a very, very difficult task. And what I, what I want to stress is these recent initiatives, the Unacredit and, and the security holding, sec, uh, security holding statistics, that helps a lot. And so, uh, and the rest of the slide is what he has presented. And I have two questions about an credit. Uh, which sectors are covered, timeliness, and how much, how they define the threshold of 25,000 euros? Uh, how, how big, how much of the, uh, of the credit is covered? 80%, 90%, or how much it is? Or what are you letting, letting out? And about the securities holding statistics, uh, the, model, the sector model covers aggregate quarterly data by holder sector. Uh, the group model, uh, model covers holdings by individual banking groups. And, but I have, I have written that the survey asks for the value of each security in the Ising code. But if the value changes uh, very quickly and then they just has the, secu the, the Ising code and the value, they, I don't know how you make to know uh, the new value when you need to face a, uh, a crisis. And so, uh, hearing all of this and, and thinking about uh, what, what was in the presentation and what we are discussing, uh, I should promise to you that I haven't talked to any, uh, I haven't talked to Professor Otmar Ising before and to anyone but the questions that I'm, I'm thinking about are more or less the same that we are discussing. So the importance of quality and robustness of the data, because any data that we put in all these systems should be, should be reliable and should, be, should have high quality. Because if you just input any data or estimate data, so then all the, all the results are, are, um, could be false. And what our decision makers does need, it's to be blind with any problem with the data. So uh, quality and robustness of the data are very, very important. Uh, working with granular data, it's really much more expensive, but it's much, much easier. You don't need to ask once, and then you can combine the data the way that you want. In Central Bank of Brazil, we have a um, credit register in the supervision. Supervision is inside a bank. Then they manage the credit, the credit registers, and we at the economic department, you use those data, and we can combine it in very different ways. 
to, to see the households, to see the credit by regions, to see whatever you can think. And so it's expensive, but it's easier. But what is important uh, is to explain to the respondents why they need to give good data for us. Because if they understand our reasons, they will be cooperative. And if we are able to explain the role that we play when we set some roles, and they will work with us. And then communication is important in any, in any dimension and with any, uh, and, uh, any of our partners. Because the respondents are, are our partners, the analysts are, are our partners too, because we need to explain them what we have done, and also the board. And the board is very busy with a lot of things, and then we should help and communicate to them any of our uh, new statistics and the creativity that we have to offer them some more material. And so this is uh, uh, my, my, my final words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. So many questions. Think about the answer while Johan will give his uh, few, few thoughts about the uh, two papers. So good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, the IMF and the Deutsche Bundesbank for the kind invitation. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, so when, when, when I was uh, thinking about uh, uh, this talk and I was looking at the, at the slides from the previous two excellent presentations, I thought about which useful insights could I bring. And I came up with these three main topics. Uh, first, I would like to, to discuss the tools that are used to look at home to home data. Second, uh, the two presentations we had basically focus on financial issues. And I think it's interesting to bring uh, uh, another example, and this time on how to use whom to whom uh, data uh, uh, to understand global value chains. And finally, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly talk about uh, the importance of comparable cross-country firm level data in connection with the work of the CompNet uh, uh, research network. So on my first, uh, on my first topic, on my first block, Home-to-home um, -home data, as we've seen, provides rich insights, and the set of tools for analysis uh, includes network network analysis, network theory. So we've seen some of that already, and, and it's, I'm going in, in, in this direction. Um, so when we think about networks, we have basically visualization techniques. Uh, basically, we can identify agents as, as nodes and the links between them as, as edges. And this is nowadays quite common. We see these kind of uh, uh, diagrams everywhere. It's also on our, on our logo in this, in, in this conference. There's, there's one of them. Uh, and these are very powerful uh, tools. Um, mostly, they base on a force-directed layout algorithm, so some centrality measures in terms of deciding where to place each, each node. And then uh, it, it is possible to give colors to the different nodes and the thickness of, the, of these edges are attached to different dimensions. Uh, and basically, this is, this is important and it's being used more and more. Uh, but we need to go beyond visualization techniques to obtain indicators that in some way describe the topology of the network and allow for tests. So we would like to have basically node level node level indicators uh, that in some way can be used in econometric exercises and they can be used for example as instrumental variables if we want to go into causality they are good they are good candidates um, and also we can have network level uh, uh, measures which can be used for example to calibrate some features in general equilibrium models so we should, we should focus not only on the position and the importance of each node separately, but also on the complete set of interactions that, is, that, that, that are established uh, and that establish the key properties of the whole, of the whole network. Uh, I, I had some of these uh, indicators here listed just, uh, just as examples. Uh, we have the degrees, uh, and we can have a degree, it's a number of 
uh, uh, edges uh, that, that are connecting to each, to each node. Uh, we can have it for each node, and we can have the average degree in, in the network. We can have centralization measures, uh, basically how a network is, is centered around one or two few important nodes. Assortativity, uh, if high degree nodes in a network are connected with high degree nodes or, or, or the reverse. And clustering, how, how tightly clustered the network is, basically the probability of two nodes being connected if they share a mutual neighbor. So this is the kind of thing that can be, that can be computed. Um, basically, home-to-home -home data is, is classic in international trade. So we have countries that uh, trade, so we have exports, imports, we have products moving. Um, and the World Trade Web has been represented as a network uh, uh, already, uh, and there's a strand of literature on this. But also nowadays, we have global, global value chains, which became the paradigm in, in world production and, and, and trade. And this has shifted our attention uh, from uh, basically gross trade flows into uh, trade uh, uh, in value-added uh, 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 data. And uh, I cannot resist just saying one or two things about global value chains. Uh, uh, I guess we are all somewhat familiar with, with, with this new reality. Uh, we have this international fragmentation of production with parts and components uh, being produced in different locations and then being embodied in, in, in the final product, either sequentially or assembled in, in the final location. So this raises lots of important questions uh, uh, on uh, in which stage most of the value added is created. Um, and also, it has a deep, a deep meaning, uh, a deep uh, impact in terms of how we interpret this, the, the, the classical gross trade statistics. I mean, the, the uh, um, market share indicators, the uh, real exchange rate indicators, all of them are usually computed in terms of in gross trade flows, and it can be quite different from these uh, trade in value added uh, flows. So let me show you one, one example. Uh, we, we have, uh, back in the Bank of Portugal, we, 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 we were setting up a network of trade in value added, uh, a kind of a, a directed and binary network, kind of a simple one taking 40 countries existing in this world input-output database, which is a global I.O. Uh, input-output ma matrix. Um, and we were setting edges, so these links between countries, according to this rule. If gross exports of country A embody more than 1% of value added originating in country B, then we would have an edge departing from B to A. And we do it for this period 1995-2011. And this is what you get. I don't know if it's easy to, it's not easy to, 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 to see all the details, but I will try to guide you. The, the, the size of the node here is proportional to total degree in, in the country, and the darker uh, uh, the, the node, the larger the in degree, the number of errors come, come, coming in. So if the country is important as, as a kind of a client. And then countries are located according to this uh, uh, Harold Karen uh, multi scale algorithm. And this can be done uh, in, in a template in Excel. This Node XL software does this in, in a very simple way. Uh, so what we have in terms of results, we have Germany and the US as a, in the central positions. And they have a similar, nodes have the similar size, so they have a similar degree. But Germany comes with a darker color, so Germany is more important as, as a client, while the US is mostly, is mostly a supplier of value added. And when we look at the countries in, 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 this, in this representation, it can, they kind of uh, tend to be uh, uh, organized according to regions. So we have Asian countries at, at the one point, we have America, we have the Euroasia. So you see some regional patterns. When we turn to 2011, we get this. So the network is denser now. China joins the inner core, and Russia shows up as important as, a, as important supplier of energy. So it takes it takes a role in, in the network, um, and these regional patterns go away. So we move from kind of a regional uh, value chains into uh, the so-called fact factory world. We've gone deeper in the sense that uh, we decided. Uh, to consider goods and services as inputs and, and outputs, um, and we were looking at, at, at the importance of, 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 this, of these networks, just taking these, these two dimensions. 
And here you have the sub sub the sub uh, 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 networks, goods to goods. So you can see if suppliers of goods value added. How how is it embodied in, in goods exports? And here in this in this network, uh, goods to goods, China and Germany are at the core. Well, when we look at services to goods, then it's Germany and the, and the U.S. Goods to services is a really sparse network because technology mean technology imposes this. So few goods valuated is embodied in services valuated. And services to services, these purely services-based GVCs, in, in, in that one, uh, the US is, is at the core. Uh, the utilizations, we've mentioned this. So this, is, this can be used to identify hubs in GVCs and their sectoral, sectoral panners. And propagation of shocks and resilience is also important in terms of trade, not just the for, for, the financial, for the financial issues. Uh, we can think about the great trade collapse uh, uh, in 2008, and then the events following the earthquake uh, and the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan in, in 2011. So those were important moments, and they had a substantial impact in, 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 in the world economy. There's a kind of a, a, bull, a, a bull whip effect along the supply chain that is very substantial. We decided then to focus on these four main players, uh, and we wanted to see which supply linkages are dominant in terms of their role as hubs in GVCs. And when we look at these graphs, basically we see the US and Germany as kind of having mature, mature GVCs, um, while, while we see China really, really increasing and Russia showing some volatility, which is attached mostly to oil prices. Let me briefly now show you these uh, network level measures that I was mentioning at the beginning. When you look at the average degree, we have this quite clear picture that uh, each country has a larger number of suppliers nowadays, and so the GVCs are becoming more, more complex. Centralization is going down, so we have more players. So it's still, the, the, the network is still quite dependent on, on, on a few big nodes, but it's, it's getting a little less dependent. Assortativity, we have a dissortative pattern as highly connected, uh, um, basically, uh, those that are high, uh, have uh, those big big nodes are connected uh, uh, with with uh, with the poorly connected nodes, and the global cust clustering. What we have here basically, um, we see that uh, uh, we have a, a, a hierarchical structure as countries group together around some some influential players. So, coming close to the end, utilizations, uh, we've seen the way forward it would be to go firm level in this type of analysis. So again, uh, uh, big data. If we get business to business data, it's possible to also to look at the role of the non-exporters in this process because sometimes we say that only, only a small group of firms is important to, 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 to discuss exports, but the truth is that the small firms, which are sometimes not, not, not exporters themselves, they are important as suppliers of these other large firms in the country, which are the big, the big exporters. So going firm level here, it would be, it would be very useful. And this large, this large scale data is, is basically available in tax administrations, but it's very hard to obtain for research purposes, photo motives that, we, that we've discussed already. Um, so finally, one word about the CompNet. Uh, basically, we, we've, we've discussed this also today, earlier in the day. Uh, the policymaker tends to uh, target the, the average firm, trusting that that's where, that's where the action is. And that's true if we have this kind of Gaussian world, the average should be close to the mean and close to the, to the uh, uh, the average should be close to the mode and, and the median. But the truth is that then we, when we look at firm level data, we know that most of the times the world is not like that. So we have mostly a Pareto distribution. So targeting at the average firm can, can mean uh, making a, a, a big mistake. So we really need to go into firm level data and we need cross country comparability also. Because for example, if you think about markups, uh, what does it mean to, to identify a big markup in one industry in one country? Uh, there are technological aspects at play, so you need to compare with the same industry in, in other countries to have any, any kind of robustness uh, uh, conclusion, conclusion. So comparability is, is important, and CompNet was actually trying to do this. Um, basically, the idea was to compute comparable firm-level indicators 
uh, focusing on competitiveness. And national teams in each central bank uh, would, would run uh, a similar code on their own databases. So as a way to overcome these confidentiality issues and some modules on trade, productivity, labor market, financial and markups were, were were at play, and already some of the results uh, are, are the results are available, and some of the output uh, has been already published as as a working paper. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, John, for this uh, very provocative uh, presentation and illustrating how we can use uh, networks uh, graphics. Now I'll open the floor uh, to uh, to you. Uh, yes, I, ca I can't see your flag, but. Uh, my question to Marcus, um, it's not always, it's not the case, always case that the, the level of um, indebtedness is the source of systemic risk. It is often the speed of liability accumulation is the source of um, systemic risk. I wonder whether your index is, uh, uh, is, a, is easily accommodated to capture that fact. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, perhaps I can just combine it and address the earlier questions as well. Um, so how would, one question was, what's the time dimension of these lambdas? And I think uh, ideally would like to collect a panel uh, which has fairly stable lambdas over time. But the lambda can, of course, depend on the stress scenario you keep in mind. So if you have forced baseline stress scenarios, you will have a constant lambda over that. But you might also have some stress scenarios which are focused in a particular, you know, which are very timely stress scenarios, and then the lambda would change for these stress scenarios. So you have to take this into account. Uh, how would you, the other question was, how would you automize the calculation or operationalize uh, the whole thing? I think one interesting thing I would like to see is that where we have what we do a lot, we do a lot of network analysis based on exposure data, on actual links, but how can we do it for virtual links? And then we can contrast the network with actual exposure links with virtual links, which take the price effects into account, and just see the contrast, and it would be nice to, to see the contrast, and I think it is very first order important. Concerning uh, the speed, I totally agree uh, that the speed issue is, is an important element. But I think the speed is also, is also an element of response. So that means just a very speedy response. And I think if the response essentially is fire selling, then I think the speed is much faster. If the response is, you know, I take this as a cheap buying opportunity, then it might take a while to, to respond to that. Uh, the current framework is not adopted to have the, an exact speed, so that's a good suggestion, but I think it can be adopted to take this into account. In particular, if you take into account that the fire cells occur at a much faster speed than taking the opposite, being acting as a stabilizer and stepping in and, and levering, uh, holding out on these positions. Patrick. Uh, thank you. I have actually two questions. One for Marcus, and I'm just curious: is what are the background assumptions, implicit or otherwise, about who knows what? So, I have in mind here, say, the Japanese banks who themselves didn't hold any or didn't hold many mortgage-backed securities, but nobody else knew that they didn't hold any mortgage-backed securities. So they get clobbered in the swap market funding costs, just like everybody else, because credit risk amongst everybody was so high and there was zero information in the market, not amongst policymakers, but in the market about who held what. So, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to when you collect this statistic and you ask the Japanese bank what's your, uh, what's, what's your uh, lambda or what's your uh, uh, liquidity mi uh, uh, mismatch index, they're going to tell you, well, okay, it's 6% it's, it's or 8% or whatever it is, are they going to be able to say they, their loss would be even larger given that they, have, uh, that, that they have exposures to other entities who themselves are exposed to the shock but they don't know how much it is? And are they able to f factor into that the fact that nobody's going to believe them when they try and convince the market that they don't hold any toxic assets? So that's sort of one question. The other question is for Mr. Schubert on this uh, whom to whom um, world uh, of statistics. Uh, if I'm understanding you correct, correctly, this is still a statistical world where we're taking the national balance sheet as the 
as the, as the base level with the national sector, so we have actual country borders. And, you know, if I have a, if I have a uh, Canadian mining company that receives a loan from a Japanese bank out of London, the Canadian mining company is, say, in Germany, that's a cross-border flow connection between the UK and Germany, but without information about the nationality, where the ultimate consolidation borders of those balance sheets lie, I don't know how I'm supposed to infer from that what, uh, where the risks are, in a sense. So the national border concept for, for sectors and, and, and for data collection makes sense in a world where all we're trying to do is figure out the direction of capital flows, but to link those capital flows to underlying equity or capital or anything else requires some, some ability to superimpose on top of that the consolidation perimeters on both sides of that transaction as well as the risk parameters. I'm just curious if there's any work done in that where, area. Take, we'll take the other question. Uh, I can't. I can't see the name. Yes. Is your microphone on? Push. Push the button. It has to be red. Not working. Use the other microphone beside you, perhaps. Can you, can you bring a microphone? Because we can't hear you, sorry. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Marquez. Uh, uh, you said that uh, to identify the systemic um, risk map, uh, especially in the liquidity mismatch, you said that uh, you don't need the high frequency and uh, high granular data. Uh, I would say that I, I disagree with that because uh, usually the crisis, financial crisis, is uh, triggered by the uh, liquidity crisis. Uh, and we, as the central bank and also as the lender of the last resort, we have to know exactly what happened when the vulnerabilities happened, and especially when the bank run has happened. Uh, we have to know exactly what happened in the market because almost all of the banks uh, come to our try to gain the liquidity or obtain liquidity in the money market. So we have to know exactly what happened in its, its institutions, especially the banks, and uh, we have to know in a high frequency, even in the uh, hourly and uh, from the morning, uh, midday to the, to the afternoon, we have to know exactly what happened in the money market and also the uh, effect to the uh, banks uh, in its individual banks. And uh, I think uh, we have to know exactly the classified is uh, the financial condition during the normal condition. I think it's okay if we want to identify or map the risk, uh, we can do the uh, low uh, frequency and low granularity. But when the uh, vulnerabilities is happen, we have to know exactly uh, the high frequency and granular data of its uh, institutions, especially the banks. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I, I did the research and I, I can conclude that the, uh, the systemic uh, risk chain is not permanent. It's uh, rather the temporary uh, for specific period. And I think uh, it could totally different when the vulnerabilities happened the uh, institution, which is the SOC observer, might be completely changed to the uh, SOC uh, amplifier, especially when there is rumors and the psychological effect of the depositors. So it it's again depends on the uh, situation of the uh, financial market and the condition. So I, I would say that uh, it is better for the central bank to have the uh, high frequency of the uh, and also high granular for the financial market, especially for the bank, uh, to again uh, uh, to decide uh, the lender of the resort policy because we cannot 
just lending uh, the money to the institution, which we don't know exactly the, uh, the situation or the balance sheet of the uh, banks uh, at each of the uh, period, uh, especially each day or maybe uh, uh, daily or hourly situation of their liquidity. I think, student, I would like to know your uh, opinions about that. Okay, I'll take a last question here, and then I'll ask the uh, authors to comment, to answer. Okay. Try, to, try to be concise. Sure, thank you. Emil Dimitrov, Bulgarian National Bank. Uh, the question is directly to you, it's not to the speakers. Uh, in the very beginning of the session, you mentioned about the balance sheet approach of the IMF. It's a very famous approach. But within this approach, there is a two very important requirements for the data information about the maturity structure of the instruments and also the currency structure. But this information from the point of view of uh, documents, international standards which are issued by the IMF are in, should be included in the, and they are included in the balance of M6 manual, which included also IAP requirements. However, as far as I know, those requirements regarding IAP are not obligatory. Probably because 2008, when the last manual was issued, it was a little bit late. But my question is, as this information is very important for the financial stability, and probably the next manual will be, let's say, in five or seven years, do we maybe expect any, using the European terminology, some amendment of the current manual in order these requirements to become international standards for all countries. And just to clarify, it's not important for Bulgaria, this question, because since end of 90s, we have, for the external debt, granular information, loan by loan, currency, maturity, and also as a members of the European system of central bank, we are participating in the security holding statistic database. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So I will... I will ask, uh, I'll answer at the end. Uh, I'll ask the uh, Marcus and then uh, uh, Aurel, and maybe you can answer some of the questions that were asked uh, by Catherine. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, these are all interesting questions. So the first question, who knows what? Um, I think that's exactly one element we want to go after when we try to figure out how do people think they react and is it mutually consistent? And of course, they might not know that there are some linkages. So the advantage of this virtual link essentially is that you can plot this first round effects and then you go, then you see there will be second round effects and third round effects. And that's essentially what this, then you derive an icon vector essentially. And then you can derive this. Of course, it might be that individual members in this community don't know it and they have mutually inconsistent plans. They don't see the third round effects hitting them back. But then you could make this public and bring it back this information to market participants, and then they would be aware of that, and this would help actually uh, stabilize the situation. On uh, the high frequency versus uh, less high frequency, uh, so I, I agree, so that I just wanted to draw a distinction between the two elements of systemic risk. I think once you're in a crisis and you think, you know, should we open the discount window, whom should we lend to as a central bank? You need very high frequency, very granular data. But in order to figure out, you know, is there some imbalance building up, and this imbalance are not building up over, you know, an hour or so, they're building up over months. So then it's actually sufficient to have lower frequency. You can actually go take the broader net and go for lower frequency. Of course, if a crisis then erupts, then you need to know the high frequency data in order to be able to intervene. So it might be better to collect the high frequency data all the time, but it might be more efficient to collect it you know, just when you see some imbalances are building up. Now I would like to collect high frequency data in this, in this area because the imbalances are building up and now I really zoom in. The element I would like to stress here is that what we observed in crisis, that the trigger of the crisis is different from crisis to crisis. So trying to figure out what will trigger the next crisis is very, very difficult. But the amplification, once a trigger happened, the amplification structure is similar from crisis to crisis over the last 200 years. So the emphasis should be much more, what is the vulnerability 
whatever the trigger might be, but let's focus on the amplification and let's try to understand the amplification and let's you know try to push the market in such a play, in such a way that the amplification is minimized. So even if the trigger happens, then there will be a smaller crisis and sometimes a smaller crisis can be he he healthy to stabilize the system in the long run. Uh, the questions from, from Katrin very quickly on, on the credit register and the credit. Uh, again, just to say these are currently planned, so it's by no means decided yet, but uh, which sector, so it is, as a, I guess you mean counterpart sector, so it is uh, non-financial corporations as we, uh, and uh, legal units, so it's uh, basically also government and, uh, and uh, interbank uh, loans. Uh, the data should, most of the data monthly, some quarterly, why 25,000? And I said we tried multi-purpose use. If you look, we have about 100 use cases. So they are, the, at one hand, you have the risk managers who want 10,000 because that's the limit on which the ECB takes in uh, loans from uh, as credit claims, as security for, for liquidity. Others uh, wanted higher numbers. So this is currently a, a compromise. But at the, I mentioned the capital markets union where the, the focus on financing of small and medium-sized enterprises are very big. So so you need a number which uh, represents also SME uh, uh, borrowing. Uh, but around here, you have colleagues uh, from Portugal, you know that uh, uh, there it starts with 50 euros. So it's basically every loan is, is collected. Then you have countries which Spain with 6,000. And in this country, it's a, it's a million currently. So um, like always, it's a, it's a compromise. and. Uh, and the, the third one was what coverage? Um, okay, I don't. Uh, uh, okay, and then on the security holder statistics, uh, yeah. just to clarify, maybe it was for equities. We have the number of shares, and they are then valued by the by the by the centralized securities database on a daily basis. And for debt securities, we have the nominal value, not the market value. Uh, and then the, the market value comes from from the centralized securities database. So. Uh, I think these were, were, were the questions uh, to me and uh, yes. Okay, before uh, I'll just answer very quickly to your question. I have good news and bad news for you. Uh, the good news is that there's a lot of experiment with uh, those concepts as you have seen during the today. And this is happening in Europe. It's also happening at the IMF and other international and regional organization. The bad news is that it takes more than five years to change a manual. It, gestation time is about 15 years, so uh, uh, don't hold your breath for the new manual, but slowly but surely we're going to be through those kind of conference and through working groups in Europe, uh, through our, our uh, advisory committee, progress will be made and it will be standardized. So manuals often is not a precursor of uh, practice, but it's the compilation of good and best practice. Uh, before we close, yes. Yeah. No, I just forgot, sorry, to, to answer uh, Patrick's question. Yeah, yeah, no, it is uh, ESA or SNA based uh, currently, so the national concept. But it's clear that um, uh, I mean, one thing which we don't cover yet are our supervisory needs. And there, obviously, there is a, quite a divergence in the supervisory culture. Some want fully consolidated data, others want solo data and consolidate themselves. But uh, this is a very important question. But currently, it's just SNA based. So before closing, uh, I would ask uh, if Jean or Catherine has a last word of wisdom to share with the... <laughs> no, I have just one, one information that uh, we repeat so much uh, importance to the home-to-home -home, uh, matrix and the balance sheet approach that the IFC is organizing workshops in any continent. Then it has a training because advanced countries are already there but the emerging economies are still catching and trying to catch them. And then the IFC organized uh, workshops in Asia. The Central Bank of Malaysia uh, hosted in East Europe. Uh, Central Bank of Turkey hosted it. In uh, Latin America, was Central Bank of Brazil. And we are organizing another one in Africa that we will uh, be holding next year in Algeria. And so it's important. We recognize there are a lot of things to do, but it's really difficult the statistics to get for everybody. Uh, I was not really commenting. I was more complimenting our, uh, the talks that we've had. So basically, I, I want to just to stress this final idea. With these types, with these new type of data, we also need 
uh, new types of tools. I mean, so there are some tools that come from other disciplines. Uh, network theory has a body of knowledge that uh, it, it will be useful for us as economists to, to bring and to use. Uh, so I think this is something for us to, this kind of bridge is something for us to start building. Thank you. I know there was other questions, but uh, German time is now T plus 10, mm -hmm. which is a disaster for the chairman. I would like you to join me to thank this great panel, and I think we can continue the discussion with a drink. <laughs> <laughs>